Good morning. Buenos dias, as it is say in Mexico. It is good to be back with you all after our trip to Mexico. And going to a third world country, specifically a country that speaks another language, is interesting. And I found myself trying to uh, pick up on some of the phrases. I mean, you've picked up on some of the phrases that say hello and good morning. And gracias means thank you. I found myself saying that a lot. And, you know, when somebody would give me something or we'd do signs and wonders and I would say thank you at the end. And on our trip back, uh, most of our stewardess were uh, speaking Spanish and our last flight was with Delta. And uh, they were English speaking and I still find my, found myself saying gracias because I got in that habit this past week. But we were blessed uh, to take a trip down there, spend some time with Roger and Becky. Uh, Tony and Linda, uh, yes, your grandson is taking after you, Tony. Um, he is adventurous and filled with energy, so they are doing well, little Ezekiel and Zara. We got to spend an evening with Jason and Jamie as well, got to see into their coffee shop. A specific prayer request for them as they're headed back uh, hoping to head back for a trip later this year, back in time for Tristan and Stacy's wedding, and they are still working on a uh, visa there. So please be in prayer uh, for that, so that that process would be expedited. Just a note from Roger and Becky, they wanted me to pass on and just say thank you for the support. Several of you sent some gifts down with them, and overall, they said they feel supported. Very with, with prayer, finances, gifts, whatever it is. So I want to bless you as a church for that. That is hu a huge asset. That is our little way of being involved in their work there in Mexico. So thank you for that. Keep that up. This morning, we are going back to First Peter. First Peter 3. Before we go there, I have a question for you. If somebody came up to you and asked, what is your biggest fear, what would you say? And I'm not talking about spiders or snakes or, as we experienced in Mexico, black widows and scorpions. But if somebody asked you, what is your biggest fear? Is it the future? Is it what you're going to experience? Is it something you're working with? Think about that question a little bit. What is your biggest fear? In, and this morning, as we go through the message, I do have some illustrations from Mexico. I'm going to start off with a story about Ezekiel. One thing that intrigued me is you always see those children who stand on a table and they jump into their parents' arms. Well, Ezekiel was the next level. I mean, he would be standing somewhere and Roger or Becky would say, all right, jump. Now, he would back up the table as far as he could and go running and jump as hard and far and fast as he could. Complete trust in his mom and dad. And one evening we went down to the river, and he was climbing up on some big rocks, and he got scared. And I was the one closest by, and I said, should I help you down? And I started walking to him to help him down, and he just full send, jumped, leaped out. I said, whoa, I just so caught him. He had a complete trust in his parents. He did not fear that they would drop him, he trusted. And this morning, my message title is, Whom Shall I Fear? The first verse we're going to look at says, And who is he that will harm you, if ye be followers of that which is good? What do you fear? And who do you trust in? To start us off, I would like you to take out your songbooks and turn to number 519. Damien intro introduced this song to us a while back, and it has really stuck with me. Number 519 in your Songs of Faith and Praise. I'm sorry. Songs of Faith and Praise, number 519. God is my refuge and my strength. To preface the message this morning, I would like us to sing this. And as we sing, really think about the words as we talk about God being our refuge. Number 519. <coughs> God is my refuge and my strength, a present help in time of need. He is my fortress, my deliverer, my father, my friend indeed. Lord, you're my shepherd, Oh 
So, as we go through 1 Peter this morning, chapter 3, let's think about God as our refuge. Turn with me to 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 13, is what we are ready for. And again, before we go into it, a little review. Our theme going through 1 Peter is a lively hope. As we go through this, I want us to see the lively hope that we have in Jesus. And that causes us to rejoice. Our lively hope that we have should cause us to rejoice. We then looked at a call to a holy life, which gives us a desire to dig into the word. A holy life brings about a desire. Then we talked about living stones. We are taken from dead stones into living stones, and that gives us purpose. That gives us purpose in life. We are now living stones in Christ. And now that we have purpose, Jesus calls us to a life of a stranger. And that is in the form of submission, as we saw in chapter 2. Respecting authority, living as servants. And then we looked at a married life. And what legacy are you leaving? And at the end of that, it called us to all Christians in the middle of chapter 3. And pretty much summarizing that is a call to love and put aside our differences, not rendering evil for evil. And now we transition into the last section of, of 1 Peter, and he transitions to looking at suffering. As a Christian, this morning I want us to see the blessings in suffering so we combat the fear of man that is prevalent as humans. I want us to see blessings in suffering so we combat the fear of man. My title, Whom Shall I Fear? So join me in 1 Peter chapter 3. Today we are going to look at verses 13 to 22. And who is he that will harm you, if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that, whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth now also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. Suffering for doing good is the heading of my, in my Bible, uh, over this section. The theme I want us to see is, whom shall I fear? Back to the question, what's your biggest fear? And what do you do with that? Last uh, Sunday, Drew shared on the vast power of God in the universe. That same God we can come to in prayer that same God, when we serve, when we seek that which is good, we do not need to fear anything. Peter poses the question in verse 13, And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? Nothing can harm you if we're following God, if we're seeking after good. That brings a sense of relief, doesn't it? Oh, I don't need to fear. 
Now, Peter's not saying you will not experience suffering. But you won't be harmed when we are following God. I think back to David fighting Goliath. He went in trusting God that God was going to help him with that. I had a little glimpse of of trust uh, on our Mexico trip. Flying into a Spanish-speaking country is interesting, especially Mexico City. I'll give you a little warning. If you're ever uh, planning travel through Mexico City, give yourself a nice layover so you can uh, have time to navigate the airport. Roger had warned me about it, so going down was, we had, I think, about a six-hour layover, so that was a little much, but I was actually kind of thankful for it in the end. We could relax and find our way, uh, trying to find people who speak English, and their signs are not the best. Coming back, our flight was delayed an hour and a half, which only gave us an hour of uh, time to get to our next airplane, and we had to change terminals. So we landed, and I told Ruthie, uh, please try to stay after me. I'm going to try to find my way. We started uh, walking at a quick speed, as fast as a little family can travel through a busy airport. And one of the, one of the times I stopped to talk to a uh, worker there at the airport to try to find the gates that we were supposed to go to, and my wife got talking to a lady who spoke Spanish, didn't speak English. Um, they were communicating somehow, and somehow Ruthie said, we're going to JFK, and the lady shook her head, and she started following us. She was committed to following us. So we go through the airport, we have a Spanish-speaking uh, lady following us, having full trust in me, and I had an hour to get to my gate. So we're navigating, I look at her ticket, oh, she's going to Atlanta, so that means she's going to a different gate. She's still committed to following us, so we get on the train, we change terminals, come up to security. Security sees us, and one blessing of traveling with a family is they see children, and for the most part, uh, they, say, get, get, they go the extra mile to help you. They pulled aside a separate lane, specially marked for families. It was totally empty, so we went right in. I thought, oh, this lady's following us. What is she going to do? I look back. I'm with them, is what she said. <laughs> and they left, her, they left her come through, and... One big happy family, we moved to security, and she was right on our tail. She trusted us. Finally, we got to our right uh, terminal, and I found her gate for her and told her to stay there till her plane leaves. And we went, and I think we were the last ones on our airplane. We just so made it. But in that experience, I saw that she had complete trust. Somehow, something Ruthie said to her or did, communicated to her, gave her a level of trust in us. And as I was preparing for this message, I thought about that. That is, should be our experience with God. I'm with Him. When we face trials or suffering that comes up in life, it doesn't need, we don't need to face it ourselves. No, I'm with God. It's not about us. And He will lead us through. When we seek that which is good, We don't need to be afraid of harm. And I'm going to jump down to verse 17 now. He kind of, this is, the verse 13 was the beginning of this thought. And verse 17, Peter kind of ends the thought. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Brothers and sisters, God wants us to see us suffering for doing well than to take a step back and not be courageous and suffer for doing what we aren't supposed to. God would much rather have us suffer for doing what is right. And here I see the difference between harm and suffering. I said we don't need to be afraid of of harm in verse 13. And then Peter says here, but you're going to suffer. You might suffer for doing what is right. Even if you're doing the right thing, you might suffer because of the battle of the kingdoms. Satan doesn't like to see you pursuing that which is good. So he's going to fight back. The difference between harm and suffering. Harm is to bring about uh, danger or to, br- to have a bad intentions. God will never have bad intentions for you. That's Satan. So you don't need to fear harm. You may experience suffering, which is pain discomfort at times 
God does allow that, but he does not allow Satan to harm you. When we are following him, he's with us. We don't need to be afraid of harm, but rather rejoice when we experience suffering. And I can almost imagine Peter stopping as he's writing this, maybe shedding a tear. Because was there a point in his life when he didn't have complete trust? In the garden? Back when Jesus was being tried, denying him? He didn't have that complete, I'm with Jesus. He said no. He wanted to take a step back. And he suffered for wrongdoing in that case. And I can almost see the emotions coming out of Peter here. Brothers and sisters, don't do that. Don't take a step back. But rather say, I'm with God. I'm with him, and he will not harm us. God has a a will to bring us to an expected end. So, suffering for doing good. I have three things that we can look at in this passage as we think about suffering for doing what is good. Verse 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. So, when you suffer, put a smile on your face. That's hard to do. Happy here can be, comes from a, a, a Greek word that means blessed. So maybe not a smile all the time, but maybe a, a sense of rejoicing that we can suffer for the cause of Christ. Did you ever take a blow for somebody? Step in the way to, to keep them safe. Or maybe sometimes uh, <clears throat> some... Uh, Individuals in my family are sick or not feeling well. And I might tell my wife, I just wish I could take your sickness for you. You ever wish that? You could step in the place and take it for them. Because it, it gives us a cause. We're stepping up to the plate. That is to be our experience when we face suffering. God, I'm doing this for you. That is supposed to give us a response of rejoicing. My first point this morning is in response to suffering, is rejoice. Rejoice when we get to suffer for the cause of Christ. Don't be afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Don't be afraid about the things that arise, the harm that seems to be coming your way. God is watching over you. Rejoice through suffering. That is the first step that Peter calls us to in responding to suffering. The other aside to rejoicing is becoming bitter or starting to pity yourself. That's easy for me to do. When life gets tough, I'll have it so hard or this or that. But don't do that. Rather respond with rejoicing to suffering. That is what Peter calls us to. Rejoice when we experience suffering. Secondly, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts... And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Our second response to suffering is to respond by sanctifying God in our hearts, as Peter calls us to. What does sanctifying God in our hearts mean? Uh, Peter actually takes this quote from Isaiah 8 where Ahaz is faced with a crisis. Ahaz was the king of Judah. And there was a crisis of an invasion by the Assyrian army. And Israel and Syria wanted to form allegiance with Judah to combat Assyria. Ahaz rather said no to that. And he confederated himself, made an alliance with the Assyrian army to avoid the attack. And prophet Isaiah comes to Ahaz and warns him and says, Don't side with them. But rather, sanctify the Lord of hosts, and let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. Ahaz wanted to go do his own way to combat this suffering that was going to come. Rather, Isaiah said, no, put God first. And really, brothers and sisters, this morning, in response to suffering, put God at his rightful place. That is sanctifying the Lord in your hearts recognizing or rejoicing in the suffering and responding by saying, you know what, God? You're first. I'm with you. 
You go first and lead the way. I will follow. What happens when we have God in us? When we sanctify God? When we put him at his right place? We're going to be ready to give an answer. When we respond with bitterness or pitying ourself in response to suffering, that gives a bad taste in the people around. But rather, when we respond by putting God at his rightful place, that gives us a soft answer. And people looking on say, wow, that brother, that sister has peace. And can you think of people that have faced suffering? Can you think of those who've had peace and put God in their place? Recently, uh, Nelson lost his wife, Nelson and Krista Root. And through that, Nelson had a surrender, a peace. And people looking on saw that. And that speaks volumes. Brothers and sisters, when we put God at his place, when we experience pain and suffering, that gives, puts us in the place to respond with a soft answer. To tell people the hope that you have. Maybe sometime God allows suffering so that you can be a witness to those who are watching. So put God at his rightful place. Rejoice in suffering. Respond by sanctifying God. And when people question you, that last part of verse 15 is powerful. With meekness and fear. Don't respond to justify yourself. Not like a prosecuting attorney. But respond as a witness. This is what God is doing. When we respond to justify ourselves, that is not putting God at his rightful place. Purpose is not to win an argument when we respond, but to win lost souls. When we share what God is doing in our life, it's not to win an argument or a discussion that we're having, but rather to point lost souls to where our peace is. Rejoice, respond, and thirdly, verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. The third part to responding to suffering is restore a good conscience. If somebody was to ask you what your conscience, what's conscience? What would you say? Knowing the difference between right and wrong, right? Each one of us has a conscience. The inner spirit, the Holy Spirit works with that conscience. No, Zach, that's not right. Zach, you know you should make this choice. Each one of us has that. And it is up to us to restore that conscience. Because we are humans, we, we fail. Sometimes we choose the wrong thing. But we can restore that how? By coming to God's word. Conscience is our internal judge. It's a window that lets in God's light. And when we come to the word saying, God, what do you have for me? That opens up, that cleans that window of conscience and allows God's light to shine in and direct our path. So, how does this help with suffering? Because when our conscience is at its proper place, when it's clean, when God's light is shining through, we have the ability, the Holy Spirit speaking to us, to guide us through the pain, making the decisions. Keep your conscience pure. It can be restored in the light of God's word. The importance of conscience, conscience gives us courage. Because when our conscience is right, when we feel good about our conscience, we know that we're right with God and man. That gives us courage to go forward. Secondly, it brings peace. Peace within allows us to face battles without. If you're conscious, if you have a guilty conscience, you can't fight the things that are going on. But if you have a clean conscience, you can fight those battles that are on the outside. Another thing about conscience, it removes fear of what people can do. It puts your fear in God and not in man. When we have a guilty conscience, we, we fear, oh, what would be found out? Keep your conscience pure. 
restore a good conscience. Rejoice in suffering. Respond by sanctifying God, putting him in his rightful place. Restore a good conscience in the light of God's word. So that is Peter's main point. He says, this is what I want to call you to. Through suffering, you can respond like this. Why? Because of Christ's example. Christ went through it. We don't have to navigate these waters first. Christ already gave us the the model, the example that we are to follow. And to quickly summarize the last part, uh, jumping in at verse 18. For Christ also once suffered for sins. Christ went through the suffering for you and for me. He knows what it's like to experience pain and suffering. He did that for the unjust as us. But because of God and the Holy Spirit working in him, in verse 18, he was put to death in the flesh, but he was quickened by the Spirit. Christ suffered, but he had died and he rose because of the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he went on to preach. And if you like to study into what the verse is meaning, verse 19, they say, is one of the hardest verses to really understand. By which he, so speaking of Jesus, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison. What are the spirits in prison? Now me, I like to often take a step back and get the general application. But what is Peter trying to say here specifically? It's a little uncertain. Some people believe that after Jesus' death, he actually went into hell and gave some people a second chance. But that goes against so many other passages in the Bible. Once you are dead, you are not given a second chance. Rather, it is believed that Jesus went to the place of the Hades. If you ever studied into hell and Hades, Hades is a temporary place before going on to hell. And Jesus would have went there, and the spirits in the New Testament is often referred to angels. The angels back in the Old Testament, back in Genesis where the angels of sons of man fell and went to, the, to earth and sinned, they are now in Hades, a temporary holding place. And Jesus went to them. Why? He died, he rose again, and he went to them to say, I'm victorious. He was proclaiming his victory. Preached here, not necessarily using the word calling to repentance, but rather a proclamation of his victory. I say that to say... Christ went through suffering, and he is now proclaiming his victory. We have that model to follow as we go through suffering. They were sometimes disobedient. And, and uh, here, Peter now refers to and brings Noah into the picture. And I think he brings in Noah because the people of his day really respected him. And it was also he, Noah was also symbolic of Jesus as well. The two kind of tied together. Back in the days of Noah, God was long-suffering. He was patient. He waited. He called people to repentance through Noah. He prepared the ark. And Noah is an amazing character to look into. He is one who experienced great suffering and pain. Yet God had a plan through it all. And Noah responded to that pain and suffering with complete trust in God. I'm following him. I'm building the ark because God told me to. He did not have a fear of man. Through the water, eight souls were saved. And Peter brings in here the beautiful analogy of baptism. He refers to the, to the flood as a baptism, quote, of these eight souls saved by, by water. And then he goes into uh, verse 21. The same is like unto baptism. Just save us. Now he quickly puts in, Baptism is not what saves us, it's our belief. But baptism is a symbol of our commitment that we have a, back to our conscience, a pure conscience before God. So Peter says, Christ is an example. Look back at Noah as an example. the, The flood was symbolic of baptism that is necessary for every believer. Because why? The resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, is at the right hand of God. And he's sitting at the right hand of God, and he is over all. All angels, all authorities and powers are being made subject unto him. Whom shall I fear? Brothers and sisters, 
as we go through suffering, as we go through pain, which we are, will go through if we are following God and seeking that which is good, do not fear. Who's going to harm you if you are following the Lord? We have a role model in Christ. And he now has full authority over all powers. Our tendency is to fear man. You ever have a fear of man? What are they thinking? If you were to ask me what is my, one of my biggest fears, I think that's one of the things I, I battle with the, the most. Is what are they thinking about me? A fear of man. I tend to be a people pleaser. That's one of my biggest fears, and I need to work at that. And I got another glimpse into human tendency as well. Going down uh, to Mexico, Roger gave me the warning that in Mexico City, make sure you ask many uh, airport workers which gate you're going to, because you're going to hear many different answers. So I went down and said, all right, which gate is this plane? I showed him my ticket. Uh, gate 58, uh, gate 16, gate 1. Gate 18, I got about five different answers. I said, why? What, why can't you just tell me you don't know? So I got down to Mexico, and Roger says, they just can't stand to tell you I don't know. they got to give you an answer. Ah, they wanted to look good to me. I didn't even know them. I just wanted an honest answer. But that gave me a little insight into my tendency. Ah. We have a fear of man. And sometimes we respond out of that in wrong ways. Whom shall I fear? Don't fear what is around you. Don't fear the things you are facing. Put your fear in God. That is where the ultimate victory lies. Three questions I have for you as we uh, end this time looking at suffering. What is one area you struggle with trust? Or back to the question, one thing you fear. Stop and think about that for a little bit. What is one area you struggle with trust? Or what is one area you fear? You don't need to answer, but if you have a pen, jot it down. It's helpful for me to sometimes jot things down as I'm thinking about them. Second question, as you're still thinking about that, what is one way you are sanctifying God in your heart? I said we respond to suffering by sanctifying God. What is one little practical way we can put God at his place? Maybe it's prayer. Think about that. What is one way you can work at this week to sanctify God in your heart? Thirdly, question I have for you this morning, do you have a pure conscience? Is your conscience pure? Or does it need to be restored in the light of God's word? Is there something you need to talk about with somebody else? Because you cannot go through suffering well if you don't have a pure conscience. That's what Peter says here. Is your conscience pure? Think about those as we leave here. Rejoice in suffering. Respond by sanctifying. Restore your conscience. That will put you in a place to go through suffering well. See blessings in suffering so you can combat the fear of man and fearing the things that are happening around you. But rather, put your fear, put your trust in God where it should be. This sets the stage for us to live for God well. And that's what we're going to look at in chapter 4. Living for God. Full send per se. Full commitment. Getting outside of our comfort zone. And living for God. And we can only do that. When we are ready to face suffering well. Let's pause for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for this word from Peter. As he talks about facing suffering. 
Thank you that we know we don't need to fear. Whom shall I fear if our trust is in you? And when we seek that which is good, we, we might face suffering. But we know that we can place our trust in you. And as, as we think about facing suffering, may we respond with rejoicing that we get to suffer for the cause of Christ. May we restore our conscience before you. And may we respond by sanctifying God, putting you at our rightful, uh, in your rightful place. Help us to prepare our hearts for facing suffering for your cause and your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Eddie, if you'd have a song.